Okay, we spoke a bit about impact when we were speaking about the legislative wins with you, Zena, but what's maybe one episode that you felt was, you know, wow, this is where we can feel these are the ripple effects of actually having the podcast in the real world? Omar. Omar can you explain? Shogri. Omar Ashogri, I don't know if you watch it. Uh, ex detainee. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm used to another kind of microphone. Um, uh, Omar Shogri was a detainee in a Syrian prison, Sadneya, the worst prison, one of the worst prison in the world. And, the slaughterhouse, they call yes, it. Yes, the slaughterhouse. And, oh. um, and we, uh, we read an article about him, and we called him. I could, we couldn't see him live. We're going to meet him next month. If he were to come to Hopefully. Lebanon, he would get killed. because. Exactly. You know. So he was in Sweden, um, and uh, in his family. And uh, we, uh, we did this Saturday. It was really hard, really hard, because uh, listening to torture and listening to his experience and what he'd been through was really hard. But the impact was that this guy is always smiling, talking about hope. And yeah, no violin, nothing. And no violin. And he's so strong that he gives you hope. And he was, um, he was telling us, giving example at the end, because at the end of the podcast, we always ask, is there hope fi amal? And himself is amal. Huwe, Omar al-Shogri, if you can go through this and being alive and smiling and fighting, that we can all do this. And for me, it was an impact on me, on us, and on a lot of uh, uh, viewers, I think. Yeah, no. the, 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 uh, it's inspirational. Yeah. 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 And for me, every episode you do inspires. There is inspiration. Yeah. People get, uh, they can dream. Kill Hada, really, everyone you have, you. including me, Aki. Yeah. I've had the time to reflect on the condition of humanity. Welcome to Media, Art, and Change, Frequencies for Social Agency. I think one of the cooler and funkier panels that we have offered. I'm Saeed. I'm a first-year undergrad student at Harvard, and I'm going to be the panelist moderator today. I have experience founding the American University of Beirut's Knowledge to Policy Youth Policy Arm, and most of my background involves the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, Rotary International, and the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQA. And today, I'm joined by three lovely panelists. I'm going to quickly frame our panel. I'll introduce you all, and then we'll get right into it. So today's panel is about art, media, and change. How can we leverage art and media for change? How can we leverage art and media for community conversations? And then, I think, arguably the most important part, what are the tangible ripple effects and impact of having those conversations, the so what of it all? We're going to touch on three main topics, the Arab context, distinct challenges in those contexts, and then the future of art in the Arab world. Now it's my pleasure to introduce three distinguished panelists. I'll start with Ms. Medea Azouri. Medea, you're a French Lebanese journalist with more than 25 years of experience. Medea has been the editor-in-chief of the Noon publication, an editorialist at L'Orient Le Jour, and also a TV show and radio show host on Nostalgie Lebanon. Mr. Moeen Jabir, you're a producer and a podcast consultant at NBC, and you've worked on many award-winning TV and film productions, like The Voice. And together, you're both co-hosts, co-producers, and co-creators of the Saturday After Dinner podcast, one of the largest and most distinguished podcasts in the Arab world. And then to the end, we have Ms. Zena Dakash. Mm -hmm. Zena, you're a clinical psychologist and drama therapist by profession. You're the founder and executive director of the Catharsis Lebanese Center for Drama Therapy. Zena has worked as an award-winning documentary filmmaker and playwriter in a few unconventional contexts, prisons, rehab centers, and refugee camps around the Arab world. So welcome, Zena, as well. And I think with that frame set, I'd like to start by asking you all, you know, what came first for you personally, media, art, or change? Your interest in media, your enchantment with art, or your desire to actually have change? Maybe we'll start with you, Zena. Mm. 
Thank you, Saeed. Uh, so what came first, Baida or Jeji? <laughs> what came first? <laughs> So I'm, I'm someone who studied the BA, so I hold the BA in theater, and I was always bored while studying uh, theater, though I was a great actress, uh, and, uh, you know, on the stages of Beirut, uh, doing acting, then I was selected to be in one of the TV shows, Lebanon, Basmet Watan, if anyone knows it, I stayed there for 13 years, okay, Izo. So, um, yeah, and I was still doing this and still I wasn't satisfied because I couldn't feel the change. And okay, the change was within me for sure. I wasn't anymore Zena, the same Zena. Maybe I was a bit shy before I was Kaza. But seeing change or a change in the society, or though, for example, on TV, huh, we used to do political satire. Yani, you know, you're there talking about things as they are, but there's no change. And yeah, people would laugh and bad in. Until I had this idea of all this knowledge, Lihia Theater, and after I had this master's degree in clinical psychology, I said, why don't I enter prisons? And Drumi prison, for those who are Lebanese, you would know it's the most, it's the notorious prison, Akbar Wahde, it's huge, it holds uh, the you know, high security level prison. And with all, you know, my naivety, I went there and I said to the government, just let's do theater. But I felt that change can come if I do this. That's al Nikif. I have no idea. <laughs> so I went there with this project, definitely after having a lot of problems with the government to go there. They were like, you're crazy, la, 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 theater in prisons, because <laughs> So I go there, and my idea was to empower these inmates, all male inmates, uh, and I said, let's do a project for 15 months. Uh, I'm trying, you're trying, I have no idea where it's going to lead us. And in this play, you will convey your messages, so it's as if we're doing a riot, but a very artistic one. Uh, we're not going to burn the prison, we're not going to uh, 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 automutilation. Uh. We, we'll put them in an artistic way. So they said, okay, us, and they were crazier than I am. Yani, they believed in this idea. <laughs> oh, <hello>. ah. <laughs> oh. Hey, now we're looking back. <laughs> so we did this project, and guess what? Uh, so my intuition was right. And when you really empower people, and you help them, and they were already empowered, they needed the means. I didn't empower no one. So I offered the means, which is theater, this is what I master. And they believed in this project, and we did this whole theater play, 12 Angry Lebanese, and you can watch it on YouTube for free. It's the theater play. And we did this show inside prison, and everyone came, decision makers, uh, media, you name it, the taxi driver, everyone came to watch for two months a theater play inside prison. And what I found out two months later that the government believed in one of the messages, so they conveyed one message, which is parole. We didn't have parole in Lebanon, tarshul parole. And a reduction of sentences for good behavior, you know, so finally, after the play, we started having this law implemented. But, so did I answer you? My intuition said theater would bring change, but not anywhere, and it needed the right uh, framing. Uh, uh, ingredients is a bad duck. And I found it myself with this population and then later on with other populations. Very, very cool. Okay. Now on to Media and Mu'in. <laughs> what came first for you? This is a very tough act to follow, by the way, when it comes to <laughs> prisons, riots, you know, all of these things. Um, I think I'm just going to talk on a subjective level. Um, my journey started with media, but it was more like the rejection of media. And I used to work in traditional TV, and when I say traditional, we're talking very conservative. Not conservative politically, I mean conservative as in people go up in arms when they see a kiss on TV, which is ridiculous. Um, it was very cookie cutter, you know, everyone was coloring between the lines. I was working on one of the biggest formats in the Middle East called The Voice. And so we were just kind of regionalizing uh, already existing IP. There wasn't really anything new. There wasn't really something original in it. Um, on top of that, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of television stations in the Middle East. And they're all, 
I don't know, either uh, ego extensions of political figures, either they're state-owned uh, TVs, or they're just subject to the highest bidder. So whoever pays will get more coverage. And there wasn't really something that I could identify with, people that are not necessarily part of my generation could identify with, and it was just really weird. You know, we're more, I think, less than half a billion people in this, uh, in this region, and there wasn't really something that could be the counterculture that we wanted. So um, I basically rejected the whole thing and got into, uh, got into podcasting. And uh, obviously then I met uh, Medea, who is going to talk about herself. Uh, she was a very impressive person. We'll talk about a bit uh, how we, we met, if you want. Yeah. Totally. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and my English is not as well as uh, theirs because I'm a French uh, uh, journalist. Yeah, my English is by the Jesuit. Hey, I'm kasser, my English. And I came in. And I came in. So Anna Media came first. And I didn't know at this time because I was really young. I was 22 years old when I started uh, a radio show in Lebanon. Uh, I didn't know that change could come from there. And um, the thing is that after uh, my radio show, I um, joined Samir Asir team. L'Orient Express, and it was the best school ever to learn uh, journalism. And this is where I realized that, yes, change can come. And after, because I uh, became a columnist in uh, L'Orient Le Jour, wrote for 20 years in L'Orient Le Jour in French. And this is where, you know, when you're a journalist uh, and you write or you're in a radio show in a studio, you don't see the people, you don't see them. You are behind a microphone, behind a computer, and you don't see the impact that you can have. And I have a very nice story. Uh, one day, they called me from uh, Hossam uh, uh, Hariri School in Saida. And uh, they called me because the student, uh, en classe de seconde, so I don't know. Health grade. So thank you. Uh, were studying my articles. And I, and I said, whoa studying my articles, like Victor Hugo or someone very important. <laughs> and they wanted to meet me uh, to end this uh, month of um, work on my writing. And I went there, and I realized, yes, yes you, can, you can do something, even if it's just for one person. Uh, there were a kid, he was 15 years old, uh, total Arabic uh, language, you know, in this, uh, in this school. They don't speak French in the family and everything. And I say, did you like my article? And he said in Arabic, yes, can I, can I explain it in Arabic? And he said, please, can you translate? And I don't know if you understand. You understand what's you going on. Yeah. You see us. You get our heads. You see us. Yeah. And, and someone said, now I want to be a journalist. So if you can do this kind of change, yes. But the real change happened with Sarah. Yeah. So this is where we feel that. Yes, small changes. Mm. I, th I think into, you know, your, your journey of change started when you wanted to expand yeah. beyond the media, and I wanted to reject all of the media, so it was yeah. a nice kind of... And I wanted to expand because Saudi is in Arabic. I don't write, I don't read Arabic. So I write... It's crazy when I told you we should do it in Arabic, I remember. That. Yes, I was, what? No, and it's a wider mm -hmm. audience, and it's great. Yeah. Moving on, maybe speaking about the Arab context specifically, what are some, let's say, challenges or context-specific issues that you faced being in Lebanon or speaking about the topics that you speak on? For context, Saturday after dinner has hosted a few controversial-ish subjects in the class, from Zena Dakash <laughs> to bigger names in the US, to Mia Khalifa, Carlos Ghosn, Arab-related figures from all walks of life. So how was that received? And then maybe on to you, Zena, specific context issues that you faced. I start, you start. <laughs> yeah, no, if you want to stay in the Saturday. Anna, in the, no, I told you already, in the prison context, no, I've drank more coffee than I've done theater. <laughs> Not coffee, good coffee, huh? the government coffee. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, go to the third floor, la Anzali to the first floor, meet the minister, go to the chief, la, the chief is not okay today, wait for him two hours, you wait, you have another coffee, and no. Uh, it, was, it was a way for them to kick me out. It was, you know what I mean, this was a strategy put, and no, khalas, give up, and don't think even about doing such things, Anna. Yet, I waited, and I drank coffee for a year and a half before laying foot inside. 
So was this controversial? Yes, my whole project was controversial for them. But actually, in the end, they understood that if we put hand in hand, yani, we do this together. They didn't do anything, but they said, OK. <laughs> but you know, by saying, OK, these people will just gain. They will benefit from having a more civilized prison system, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, did I answer you? You did answer the question. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Moy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, regarding, you know, did our community kind of reject people that we might have uh, brought in? I think our definition of community is very broad and very diverse. Right? Yeah. Because you have some people that watch Saturday because they like uh, Mia Khalifa, for example, or they like, uh, <laughs> not for those reasons, not for other reasons. the same concept, but no. Um, <laughs> some people maybe came to uh, watch Rimo Nader, who is someone that uh, Mar Sherbil, who is a saint in Lebanon, came and visited and had a mark on his hand. It was this whole thing. And so when we get these controversial guests, who do we get as well? Rimo Nader, Mar Sherbil, and Mia Khalifa. Yeah, Khalifa, yeah. Full spectrum, basically. Yes. <laughs> the spectrum of our guests. And Carlos uh, Rosson. Carlos Rosson, exactly. Yeah. We're able to, who's, a, who's a, currently a fugitive. Uh, Ahmed al Bashir, who's this Iraqi incredible. Uh, Awkab Zohal, who's Awkab a drag queen. Yeah. So, yes, but it's controversial. But, but not for the sake of being controversial, yes. right? And what happens is you, have, you bring people from this side of the equation and that side, and then you bring them together, and maybe they might reject a few guests, but in the end, what remains as an audience and as a community is people who can. Listen to someone who was visited by Mar Shabel. Listen to someone who was in uh, adult films. Then listen to a fugitive. Then do this and do that. So you have this kind of like raw material of of, uh, of community that everyone can uh, can talk to. We're talking about challenges. Uh, the challenges for us, uh, they didn't come from the external. The, it's internal for us. The the challenges for me, it was speaking in Arabic. Uh, be careful about what we're saying. Even we are free. But you have to respect the audience also, and we are totally respect them free. Not, not to belittle them, intelligence. No, not at all. Respect their intelligence. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. And the challenges were there. Uh, sometimes we curse. Sometimes we curse. We smoke. We drink. We do <laughs> very fun things. We, we speak in three languages, so we we are criticized some sometimes from the. And what is very interesting, sorry for my English, uh, it's that. People like us because we smoke, we curse, and we speak in three languages. And sometimes people, they don't like us for exactly the same reason. Exactly. We, don't, we cannot please everyone. And this is, uh, this is it. So challenge, uh, internal challenge. Yeah. And so maybe shifting that, uh, what were some specific voices that you felt there was a bit of reluctance from the community to accept? I know, Zena, you started with male prisoners in Rumia prison, but then you moved on, I know, to other projects. Was there any? ever a time where you worked with a group that you know, people didn't support you working with? Yeah, and we mentioned this in our uh, Saturday episode. I was shocked when, so I started in the Rumi prison with the male inmates, then I stayed there, and in parallel with the women inmates, be Abda, Hafsa Abda, and there was this project for a whole year with domestic, uh, migrant domestic workers. So for those who never lived in the Arab world, uh, uh, in Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Dubai, you'd find it. So I'll be the kafil, the sponsor, and I'll have a maid in the house, full time, 24 hours. Uh, sorry to say this, but she can be treated like a slave. Uh, I take her passport. She's not allowed to have holidays, uh, not allowed to do anything, blah, 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 blah. You know, she just lives in my place 24 hours working. So, uh, and this is Adi, like it's normal. And I was raised this way, and I'm not someone like this, but and yeah, in our house there was a maid, and the neighbors there is a maid. You have always a maid, huh? So uh, one day I said, let's do a theater play with a group of these women, you know? And I found some sponsors who allowed me to meet them only on Sundays. So we worked for a whole year only on Sundays. And we did this play, beautiful ladies on stage, and they also conveyed their messages artistically. And I was shocked to read, uh, me who's been 10 years in the prisons, to read on social media women, a group of women who, who allied together, saying, oh, Zena Dakash, oh my God, Taib. <laughs> oh my God, she's working with these, these, Awful, ugly, uh, blah, blah, women. This woman who did the human rights for the prisoners. 
How could she work with these? Oh, they used every single word, black, slaves, uh, you know what I mean? And I've been working for 10 years with people who have killed others. This, okay, but the, the racism we had, I never knew how much we were racist. Uh, Systematic. Really, Anjad. So yeah, this, for example, was a shock for me. Yani. But yet, this play, Kamena, with the migrant domestic workers, changed a legal decision done by the Ministry of uh, Justice in Lebanon. Guess what, in 2014, the Ministry of Justice says, uh, here is a, a decision, blah, blah, blah. If you, as the sponsor, know that the maid in your house is in love on Lebanese territory, you need to go to the police and tell them. Otherwise, you'll be put in prison. So uh, there's a button saying, don't fall in love. You can't fall in love. She's a robot. You know, you can do whatever you want. And this play managed to annul, uh, to, uh, to cancel this uh, So uh, see, because the way we do this play in my NGO or any play is you do the play, you lobby, you lobby, you lobby, you invite them, you invite them, you bring the media, you bring the minister, you lock them in the, in the room for, yeah, yeah, they have to be locked very gently. But and after the play, they need to talk with the people, to the beneficiaries, hear them in front of the media. So the media is the witness also. And uh, this is a big tool that I've used, Yani. Voila. Very cool. Did I answer you, Saeed? Maybe and Moin. I think uh, we face a few challenges because, um, you know, I'm Muslim Shia, media is uh, Christian, and so. Sometimes we talk about a lot of sectarian things that are usually, you know, very taboo, but are spoken in, you know, uh, private uh, private places. So, on a personal level, I do get very much attacked by the sect that is usually dominated by one narrative, mm. uh, which is the Hezbollah narrative. The Sunni. The Shia. So between Hezbollah and Harakat Amal, uh, it's a lot of fun reading the comments and death threats and what have you. But it's it's fine, as long as you know they don't. Uh, do anything physical, <laughs> messages on Instagram are, no. are totally fine, for now, at least. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, besides you know the negativity, uh, one of the biggest challenges for me in media to kind of expand and to grow Serdi is, uh, is you know, who are we talking to, right? Is it just the people in this room? Is it our followers? Is it our subscribers? But the biggest one are, was for the people that weren't uh, digitally literate. Yeah, right? we didn't know. As I said before, when you work and you have your... Uh, podcast on YouTube, you don't meet the audience. Like, we are meeting you and thank you mm. for being there. But uh, you don't. And one day, it a story, a very nice story happened. Moin was in Dubai and he was stuck there. He couldn't uh, come back to Lebanon. He took, paperwork he, issues. Yes, a paperwork Lebanese issues. person, people will understand. Yeah. Stuck in the, in, the, <laughs> in the desert. And uh, really. And uh, I uh, and he come and he say, okay, we have to uh, we have to shoot Saturday. What do we do? And I say, okay, I'm gonna bring the equipment that is in a carry on. Uh, we take it everywhere with us. Traveling Saturday. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm coming and we're gonna shoot a Saturday here. It was in the beginning. Yeah, it's been just a year. Right. Yeah. And I arrived to the airport and uh, the guy at Amn Al Ham uh, asked passport for, control. Passport, passport, passport control. control. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not out. And uh, <laughs> he looked at me and he said, where are you going? And I said, uh, Dubai. And he said, yes, where else? And I said, oh my God, we're all going to Dubai. And no, all the Lebanese are leaving the country. And I look at him and he said, if you don't go to Dubai, how would you be able to shoot Sardi? Because Moin is stuck there. And I look at him. Oh my God. <laughs> you don't watch Sardi? You know, the guy at the Lam Al Ham. And he said, yes, all of them, keep going. And I was what? Yeah. You know, Abn al -Ham, you know, Abn al -Ham in Lebanon. <laughs> and it's, it's not right. And um, there is a lot of uh, stories like this that... Uh, Anna, I, I have a story. Uh, eh? I'm sorry, I'm cutting. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead. So, uh, 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 so Anna, I'm, I'm 45, okay? And the, the new generation, I know them, but I don't know them much. Uh, khalas, 45, you don't know the generation of the 20s. Who have been locked in these prisons for 14 years. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not a criminal, I don't know you. So... <laughs> 
So, you know, the Saturday uh, episode finishes, and uh, I had like three trips in the Arab world, one in Tunis, one in Amman, and one in Masr. You know, you're walking in the street, uh, and young people, like really 20s, 30s, maybe uh, start of 30s, you're the Saturday uh, guest. And I'm like, Isma Galat ul inu, how would they know Saturday in the Arab world? I don't know, Anna, Saturday is, it was us in the Ashrafiyya, YouTube, <laughs> me watching, you know, you don't really. Eating Riz Ajaj. Yeah, <laughs> so just like you're saying, you know, the Amn al Am person, uh, the coffee shop in uh, Masr, in Egypt, uh, Amman, uh, uh, everyone watched. I mean, the, the older generation. Really, generations yani, as well. the really older hats generation. off. Wow. I think the coolest thing as well is, the people that weren't digitally literate, their sons, their granddaughters, their Haida would tell them, watch yeah, this and watch yeah, that. Yeah. And it would be a beautiful kind of experience, yeah. right? You had people that, um, for the first time ever on, uh, on our set day, for example, we would talk about the Lebanese Civil War, which again, is a very taboo thing. No one talks about it, although hundreds of thousands of people died and there was not really any reconciliation. So we would talk about it openly and, you know, as we do on Serde. And what happened was, uh, Jana, a friend yeah. of ours, watched it with her father, who was actually a militant uh, person during the Civil War. And after the Saturday, they started talking about these things for the first time. And this is, I think, the, the best thing that we were able to and achieve. And it happened also with a uh, with girl that uh, after we, we did two episodes with Sandrine Atalla, who is a sexologist. And uh, after uh, the second episode, for the first time, she talked about sex with her mom. <laughs> and it's incredible. This is the, and this is what we want, yeah. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. I want to talk about women in the arts in the Middle East in general. Yeah, you too. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> so you said you worked in female prisons. You know, generally, what was the dynamic? What, what were most of the inmates there for? In for? The women. Yeah. Uh, in Lebanon, if, if, if a woman is there for murder, it would be the murder of the husband. <laughs> Very scary how everyone answered yeah, the right no. answer. Right there. <laughs> so why would she kill him, do you think? Domestic violence. In Lebanon, uh, there was no law to protect women from domestic violence. Uh, I don't know, the Lebanese, only you, you remember, the, I don't know, nine years ago, eight years ago, and uh, when the media started covering such things, uh, the, the Mujtama Madani civil society started lobbying, and they presented draft laws to the parliament, Will parliament used to refuse them, we naimun, kaza, so when I went to prison and I heard uh, mainly what these women want, because again, it's their place, their shows, I give the techniques, blah, blah, blah. So they said, we want to make the law for the protection of women, uh, because really it's incredible what's happening. And there is early marriage, you know, they can be married at 11, 11 years old, 12 years old, she have her baby, blah, blah, blah. So here, we joined forces, me and Kafa, and I don't know, Mikem Batfi, uh, another NGO, Abad, and da, da, da. And from the draft law they have submitted, we made scenes, yani we, we invented scenes for kind of each article in this draft law, but very subtle, and uh, you wouldn't know we're talking legally. And again, you invite the, the whole decision makers, you lock them, you bring the media, ya ta ta ta, and uh, it, it was, well, well, what was so nice while well, doing a play, it's that they see the consequences of not having a law. Uh, yani, it's not like, yeah, you know, when you go on TV, uh, I had a violent uh, drama, he hit me, I'm not making fun, it's very hard, but people don't want to hear drama. And in the theater, you have the space, it's not drama, it's she's powerful there on this stage, telling you her abuse, telling you whatever happened to her, but with a lot of pride, Kamena. Huh? So the message goes through better than... You bring her as a victim. She wasn't a victim. She was a survivor in this moment. Yeah. You know? So. And, and yeah, we and people, all of us, we like hearing survivors. We don't want to hear victimhood. I think it's a human thing. It's nice. So, voila. 
Un, euh, these women convey these messages, and in 2014, uh, we had finally the law, like a year after the end of the play. Uh, I, I definitely, I'm sure that they helped into having it implemented. So women and arts, women can do a lot in the arts. Women, I'm not, I'm not being gender hick, but women have a certain wisdom in making the message arrive, with all respect to men. But in the women, they, they can, Anjad, they can do a lot. Yeah. I, I compare it even with the men, working with the men and the women inmates. I tell you, there is, uh, there is more power, honey, and wisdom in conveying the message. Yeah. 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 Medea, you've been a journalist for 25 years. Yeah, more, That's... but uh, we cannot say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old, I'm old. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, uh, women in media, it's uh, a little bit complicated. When uh, people talk about uh, Zena sometimes, or me, they say, you know? Unfortunately, there are words and expression in Arabic that we cannot translate in English. Sister of a man. Yeah. <laughs> So they always compare us if we're strong or if we tell the truth or if we speak out loud or we say exactly what we think. Uh, they compare us uh, to men. And I'm going to say something. They say uh, about women, they have balls. Mm. We don't. We have a vagina. And it's stronger. It's really stronger. Okay. So, so it's hard for women, and you know, yeah, there's a lot of women here. And it's hard because they never forgive us if we do a mistake and if we say something. Everything is very easy for men and less easy for us. But uh, we're fighting. And I, will, I have really a lot of time being criticized because I'm a woman. Because I'm, uh, how do we say it? I'm so sorry, grand girl. You're um, yeah, I have a big mouth. And, uh, in a good way. In a good way, yeah. Outspoke, outspoken. Outspoken, thank you. And, um, and you see it not only with me, with all uh, the anchors, TV anchors in Lebanon or in other regions that are women, we're always being criticized more than uh, buffoon that you see on TV like uh, other uh, TV anchors. So it's, um, sorry, I am who I am. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated, but... Um, it's, um, it's more and more accepted, and uh, Moin helps a lot, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true, yeah, because we are a, a tandem, a duo, yes. yeah, uh, it helps a lot, because um, he says something, I can say something, and you don't see the difference. You don't see that it's a man and a woman. It's two person mm -hmm. speaking in Saturday Absolutely. and saying out loud, out loud what uh, we think, no matter what. So, yeah, I'm going to keep going. Okay, we spoke about challenges and we spoke about the Arab context, but who are some allies of you know, the art scene in Lebanon, art scene in the region? Who have been allies or entities that have helped you along the journey? In the, in the, on the Lebanese territory? Sure. There are great people, huh? but I don't know if you can get it. And you said the media. In the media, yeah, oh. yeah. The media is a great ally. The audience is a great ally. Uh, the government, when there is a government that can listen, can be a good ally. Is a nuajad, other al Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, as civil society, and I, I have founded this NGO, and just like many NGOs, uh, non-profit organizations, believe and no, the allies are always not Lebanese, Kamena. It's you get the money from outside, uh, the U.S. Uh, aid, uh, EU, you name it. Uh, it's we're, we're happy to have this, but in a, in a way, uh, you start saying, in Lahza, it's my country, the allies need to be here, not from uh, outside, you know. So now, on a governmental level, there is no allies. <laughs> there is no one yet. Yeah. Yeah, fortunately. In terms of your viewership. I, I, I think when it comes to allies, what's really cool about the podcasting space, if people don't know, it's that we're not really competing for views, right? We don't have a time slot the same way in TV. Sunday at 9 p.m., you know, everyone is kind of wants, wants you to 
watch their show or what have you. Because we are a very flexible medium, uh, we work as a community. So our allies are actually each other. Podcasters help each other. I always, last time I, I called you, I told you, let's do a podcast together. Uh, let me help you with your YouTube videos. I spoke to other podcasters like Shad Ghusan and others to kind of help each other. And it's really cool because, uh, okay, where did I go? It's really cool because, uh, you know, you, you grow together. Obviously, you have the more institutional allies. So you have uh, conferences and panels where, that are found not obviously in Lebanon because... No, not in Lebanon. Because there's no money involved maybe in the UAE or sometimes in Saudi. Saudi is doing uh, good things there. But in the Middle East, you only have yourself and your community. And hopefully, the more you grow, the more empowered you become, the more financial backing you get, and then you can create something really substantial. We were at the PodFest in, uh, in Dubai, and it was great. It was the third year, and uh, invited two years, uh, uh, what about? And it's, it's nice to see how they push you in, uh, in the Arab world. In Lebanon, not at all. And Moin was saying that he was talking to Jad Ghassan. He also uh, called, I don't know if you know her, Diana Saf, uh, Louis Diane, to tell her, look, your messages are great. Put subtitles. And so we are... A There's no competition. And not only we, um, between podcasters, all of us, all the people that are working, you know, we cannot say underground, but not on a traditional We're way. We're not underground, look at everything. Yeah. <laughs> and no, it's, and no, not, uh, you know, with the... the Like-minded. Hey, exactly. So we are the comedian that, uh, that come, all we are... We, uh, we became friends and we worked together. We all talk uh, about each other, Yanni, you know. Like the stand-up comedians in exactly Lebanon, which is coming a very new trend. Yanni yani Shadan is a friend, and when yeah. she came, it was funny. Yeah. And when Mohammed Deyik uh, um, and Hassan Kaoub, they went to uh, Jahad Ghassan, they talked about us, make, making fun of us, and it was really funny. And we are all, this is our allies. I think I think the community of counterculture is really what yeah. what Hello, allies are about. Yeah, this is it, yeah. exactly that. Because nothing that we see on television or on traditional media looks like us. Mm. So we create our own. Mm -hmm. Okay, we spoke a bit about impact when we were speaking about the legislative wins with you, Zena. But what's maybe one episode that you felt was, you know, wow, this is where we can feel these are the ripple effects of actually having the podcast in the real world. Omar, Omar can you explain? Sugar. Omar al I don't know if you watch it. Uh, ex detainee, uh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm used to another kind of microphone. Omar um, al uh, was a detainee in a Syrian prison, Sadneya, the worst prison, one of the worst prison in the world. And the women's slaughterhouse, they call yes, it. Yes, the slaughterhouse. And, oh. um, and we, uh, we read an article about him, and we called him. I could, we couldn't see him. Live. We're going to meet him next month. If he were to come to Lebanon, he would get killed. Because, exactly. You know. So he was in Sweden um, and uh, in his family. And uh, we, uh, we did this Saturday. It was really hard, really hard. Because uh, listening to torture and listening to his experience and what he'd been through was really hard. But the impact was that this guy is always smiling, talking about Hope. And yeah, no violin, nothing. And no violin. And he's so strong that he gives you hope. And he was, um, he was telling us, giving example at the end, because at the end of the podcast, we always ask, is there hope? Fi amal. And himself is Amal. Huwe, Omar al-Shugri, if you can go through this and being alive and smiling and fighting, that we can all do this. And for me, it was an impact on me, on us, and on a lot of uh, uh, viewers, I think, yeah, no. the, 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 uh, it's inspirational. Yeah. 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 And for me, every episode you do inspires. There is inspiration, yeah. People get, uh, they can dream. Kill hada, really. Everyone you have, Thank you. including me, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> make people. <Her. laughs> And maybe your personal experience, what's one story that you learned from one of the inmates that left a mark on you? Maybe one inmate or two inmates. And I, and it had an effect on you. Yeah. Many stories. Many, many stories. Um, and I have, I have this story, and no, heck, I always tell it. So when I entered prison, there was, in Rumi, there was an inmate who has been there for 18 years. 18, and he has a life sentence. Mu'abbad. Huh? 
you know, and I was thinking, no, Muabbad, he's the show, you know, and no, he's gonna stay here for. And why would he do theater, Aslan? Yani, and no, what would change in his life? And he was there every day doing with us theater. He was really great. He changed. He transformed. He started talking. He was in his zawiya week. And I remember Hek saying between me and myself, you know, I will leave prison once Yusuf leaves. Yani, in a way, it's as if I'm saying I will never quit this place. And what happens, you know, Yusuf and his uh, group, so they, we all together, lobbied and advocated for the reduction of sentences. So Yusuf benefits from this reduction and gets out a year and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> and myself, it's been two years of total chaos in the prison system because there's no government, so they are not issuing real clearances, little NGOs. I was out. Two months before him, not really out. I still help Gobas, and you cannot do the same job like I used to do it before. So we went out same year from prison, just like I said. Yeah. And, and the good story, you know, you're going to hear it now. So me and Yusuf, we meet every week. Why? One day we have a screening of one of our movies because I've done three movies inside yeah. the prison. Huh? So we tour in schools, we tour in universities, and, you know, he's the one who talks to, to the students with other Akamena ex-inmates who were out. And now I'm writing with Yusuf a, a script for Netflix about a fiction in prison. Yeah. Uh, so you see, this is a ripple effect on a personal level. Yes. Uh, now, in terms of artistic agency and control, you guys invite your guest or two guests at, on your podcast, and do you think there is any role that your experience in journalism has played? I know you all got lots of compliments and high accolades for the Carlos Rossin episode about how everyone said that they subtly guided him throughout the narrative to say you know, exactly what the world wanted to hear. What do you think? I think, yeah, what we do, we try to massage the conversation, right? We don't try to, I mean, our format is not the gotcha format, right? Where you corner someone and you berate them with questions. There's a reason why we call it Saturday after dinner. And it's not, imagine inviting someone for dinner and just completely attacking them from A to Z. Mm -hmm. It's not really a Saturday, is it? So uh, we massaged the conversation. What happened uh, was we allowed him to kind of make his case. He spoke about his experience working with Nissan, Toyota, uh, uh, all of these Renault. things. Mm -hmm. And there's something that's very special with Saturday, and it's Media Azuri, who is extremely emotionally intelligent. Uh, women are more emotionally <laughs> intelligent than men. Men are like, you know. And so, <laughs> and so what happened was, and why we got praise, because he had been asked not to talk about his daring escape. For those who don't know, he escaped in a box from Japan to, uh, to Beirut. From the prison in Japan. From the prison in Japan to Beirut. And you know, the prison system in Japan is horrifying. It's, I think it has a 99.6% conviction rate. So as soon as you're tried, you know, you're a goner. And so he was asked by multiple uh, uh, channels not to talk about it because they had shot an interview uh, with a him. A documentary. A documentary, sorry, with, with him. Shahid and BBC and TF1. And so where does Media's emotional intelligence come in? Uh, after the 45-minute mark, after he had made this case, uh, she asks him something, and the wording was very interesting. She didn't ask him, when did you escape Japan, mm. right? Any other person, such as myself, would have been like, when did you escape? Come on, let us know, tell me. She asked him, when did you decide to leave Japan? And that yeah. subtle you know, change of wording kind of put him at ease and allowed him to divulge this very secretive <laughs> way of how he escaped. And you know, under the table, Bede was just grabbing my hand, my, mm. like telling me, what the hell is happening? Why, holy shit. So, <laughs> Japan is going to come and Japan kill us. Japan is coming. The we French cannot, are coming. Everyone's go. coming. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I wish you thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it, was, it, it was great, yes. Uh, he didn't want, and he, he told us, I don't want to talk about it. And he said, I don't want to talk more than 45 minutes. Khayali. Atahla sa'atin. We balash yahke al 45. And he talked about it. Yeah. And when he finished, we, talk, we, we look at him and he say, so how was it? And he say, it was great. And we, talk, we told him, you know, we talk uh, one hour and 45 minutes. You're going to edit and cut. And, uh, <laughs> his wife uh, was there and say, no, it's the first time you, you, you talk about it uh, like this. But it, it was a game between... Uh, 
Uh, you got a few calls yeah. after that, by the way. You had the producers that I knew calling me from the actual documentary that they shot. Mm. Like, Moin, media, please. You know, the only difference between the documentary and your said is that we paid millions and millions of dollars for the documentary, yeah. and you just invited them for coffee. So please, can you just... <laughs> You know, postpone the release of yeah. the Saturday before we, yeah, we, we release it. the documentary. We removed it for a few days and we... Uh, now they owe us, so... Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up for Q&As. First, you two, who's your dream Saturday guest? And then we'll go on to Zena. What's on the horizon for you, so... My dream Saturday guest, it's uh, Haifa Wehbe. <laughs> you see why? Uh, I, I love this woman. Who is Haifa Wehbe? Who is Haifa Wehbe? Who doesn't know Haifa Wehbe? Really? Just one person? Okay. Haifa Wehbe is, Anna for me, uh, is, she's an actress and she's a singer. But uh, for me, she, uh, before social media, she changed the beauty criteria in the region. Everyone wanted to look at her, like her, like no? Her. Yeah, not me, no, because I'm blonde. But, uh, and, um, and her, her journey is incredible. She's a grandma, okay? Today she's a grandma. She's still there on social media. Everybody loves her. And I really want to host her. We're trying, huh? <laughs> We're trying. I'm speaking with her team. So. Yeah, uh, because I really want to hear her story. Not the formatted one, you know? I follow every story. Absolutely. So this is my one of my. Uh, yeah. nice. I think well, this is a, this is a request that has been you know there since mm. we started. I think our dream guest also my dream guest would be Ziad Al Rahbeni yeah. to come on and to just, to and just talk and we are just you know looking Who at. Who is him. Ziad Al Rahbeni? Ziad Al Rahbeni, I think, is one of the most prominent artists that shaped you know the the scene in the entire region, right? He's a musician, he's a playwright, he's a writer, he's a poet. He's a renaissance man that uh, we'd love to have on. He's a bit uh, of an elusive guy. Uh, he's been in the scene for quite a long time, and hopefully if we can kind of reach him yeah. the right way, we'll... Uh... Everybody's asking, please, can you bring Ziad Rahbe? You know, if it's easy, if it... If it <laughs> we'll do it, don't we? <laughs> we will do it, but, you know, if you invite uh, Ziad Rahman, you can say yes. And doesn't come. Yeah, and doesn't he's show not up. in front of us yeah. on the Saturday. We and we, we lock him, him, like you did. <laughs> I lock know. him. <laughs> I will come and lock him. <laughs> okay, and then finally, before we go into Q&As, you know, what's on the horizon? On the horizon, there is this Netflix film that I just spoke about, that it's cooking, so we're writing the script. It's a fiction. It's about prisons in Lebanon in the 90s. Wow. Death penalty, yeah. It's when corruption started in Lebanon, the 90s, huh? but with a beautiful emballage. We felt we're in a beautiful country, but the whole corruption was uh, cooking. Uh, and I'm still touring with my third film in festivals, uh, The Blue Inmates. And my films, you can find them online on Apple TV, she, she iTunes, but the good news, the whole trilogy, the three films, I've done in prison. They will be out end of March on a platform worldwide as a trilogy. Like you can get them, the three of them. It's great. Unbelievable. Yeah. So stay tuned. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to watch them in prison. In prison, in the prison. theater place and, and the documentaries. Yes. I, you the, came, yeah. I came. The third everywhere. one, Bad Majito. And at the blue, the blue inmates, I, I saw it in Lumia. Le, the play, the play, Alaf, the documentary, documentary. and it's the, the one with inmates that have uh, mental, yeah, mental illness. Mental, mental and, illness. and when you see uh, Zena working, it's whoa, it's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. Everybody, she's yelling at serial killers, sit down here, you <laughs> axe murderer, sit down. It's crazy. No, no, I'm sick. A lot of. Hey, we see it a little bit in the documentary. <laughs> 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 no. kind of. Okay. And at that, that, I think, concludes the moderated section of the panel. If we can clap one more time for our panelists. Bravo, Saeed! Bravo! Bravo! Okay. We're going to move on to Q&As from the audience. There's a mic set up here. We'll go through two, and then we'll go two at a time. If you have a question, please... Who, who gives the microphone? Microphone is standing. Oh, you yeah, and microphone. moving and mic. There's, there's one over there. Yeah, okay. It's easier. Okay. 
third down in the white. You can go ahead. Hi, everyone. I will share. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is so inspirational, Yanni. I cannot count the times I had goosebumps when you guys were talking. And thank you also for being back home and doing all the great work you're doing. This is very impactful. Uh, I have a question going back to Zena, what you were saying, and I'm guessing Z uh, Medea and Moine, you're also running into that. You mentioned that one of your allies are donors from outside, and these donors usually come in with their set agendas, but I'm sure you also have your own set agendas. So I'm wondering if you run into issues with that, and how do you reconcile both agendas and to make sure that your agendas al align and you can do the work that you want to do? It's to come in and you get sponsors, no. members. No, no. We don't no, have uh, external donor. We have our pa Patreon. Yeah, Patreon, we have other means. Um, look, I cannot generalize, but there are donors without agendas. Yani, not the agendas. I, I have, uh, I'm done with those with agendas. I don't even present my projects, nor knock their doors, nothing. And those with agendas never care for any ripple effect. They care about the agenda. Publicity, right? Not uh, just publicity. Huh? It's fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. Yeah. Holy, low, yani, even if they give you $3 million, I'm not interested. Whereas I found like like the last, uh, Anjad, uh, the, the last film I've done was by Act for Lebanon USA. It was funded by beautiful, wonderful people, Lebanese, who live in the US. Um, they have this small NGO. Uh, they are philanthropists. They gather this money through fundraising events yearly. And they gave us the money to make the film. It was, for me, one of the best experiences. They are there, they encourage you, Zena, whatever you need. They come, they meet with the inmates, they talk to them, ma fi hal agenda. It's pure philanthropy halwe yani. Um, uh, it doesn't mean I'm criticizing any of the, the, the you know, Nesil Samaita Abel and the big institutions, but lately, I found a model. And the model is my, my NPO is offering to the corporate many services, we charge whatever the corporate, with this money we do our projects. Yeah. I cannot anymore deal with fill in the blanks, fill in the papers, especially in our third, the third world, the Arab world, the agenda went so much bigger that it's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. Like, I mean, we don't have, I mean, we don't have donors. Every uh, we don't have big donors. We have obviously our Patreon, which is a payment uh, gateway, and our agenda is pretty simple, right? It's the same agenda that people who support us have, which is just to create a serde after the serde. So just to create a conversation after the actual uh, episode happens. What is a serde? Okay, serde <laughs> is. Uh, <laughs> I think the only word that's close to it in a different language yeah. is sobremesa in, in Spanish. Spanish, which is basically this phenomenon that takes place at the dinner table long after the dinner finished, where you, you know, push back the chair, you sit down, and you have a very candid and, uh, and raw conversation. That's the... Nisrida. Yeah. Nisrida, it's a verb. Yeah, it's, you, uh, it's written here. And, it's and you never relocate to the living room when you are at your friends. You always okay. just stay there. So this is the said. It's, you cannot translate it. It's exactly like subhi. You can't. Mm. Uh, it's, it's just us. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Another question. Red. Red. <laughs> Hi, Red. <laughs> okay. May she? <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming out here and talking to us and giving us more insight to everything that you guys face and your goals and your dreams. Um, being from Lebanon and getting to meet creators like you, I was born and raised here. So to see this like this passion of home and, and working from there, and it's it's beautiful. Um, I myself have my own podcast. It's nowhere near where you guys are, but um, I guess my question is, where do you guys find the inspiration to continue to make new and impactful episodes? And do you ever feel disheartened by the backlash that you receive with the controversial ones? 
you guys are at 100. Yeah, we're, we reached 120,000 wow. subscribers yeah. on YouTube, and we have a couple of hundred thousand wow. yeah. spread across. <laughs> I think we're just going to start first with the, you know, the, this hard thing. Uh, thing. I think th as soon as you put yourself out there in the limelight and you put out your opinions, especially the political ones, you know, being attacked and you know having this kind of wave against you is completely normal. You shouldn't take it to heart. At first, I, it was difficult for me. Right, Media has been in the field for 25 years, so she knows how to deal with this kind of rejection. It's part of the process. It's totally fine. People are cowards sometimes, and they can say whatever the hell they want. Uh, behind the screen, so don't get phased by that. Um, what was the first part of the question? Sorry. Inspiration. The inspiration. What's the inspiration? Oof. Uh, in the beginning, inspiration was uh, what was happening in Lebanon. We, we started three, four months after the Thawra revolution. But I think that um, what triggered it was uh, the August 4th blast. The anger, uh, the will to change, uh, something in our country and to understand more what was going on there and to expand now uh, to the entire region Absolutely. because we're going back and forth to Dubai and to Riyadh and we are re realizing that uh, the States, there's right? a lot yeah and a lot that no in the in the region yeah, and, and we realize that there is a lot of things happening and we want to understand the Lebanese identity. It's very complicated, like uh, Ahmed Bashir said. The Arab identity, again, like Ahmed Bashir said, it's complicated. So this is our uh, inspiration. And, uh, and it's the people, feedback, the feedback that you get yeah, from you guys, feedback, from everyone actually. around. It gives us so much uh, yeah. uh, energy to Push. keep continuing it and shows that we're not the only yeah. At some point, we thought that we might kind of be talking to each other, like we're talking to a mirror. No one is really there to listen and then here we are you know yeah. sitting down in front of you guys knowing that we're not alone in this and that people are listening so you guys i also like two questions one after one another black green. and the black and green <laughs> no what about the land <laughs> yeah the black but then green then we can stay here all day by the way we're here yeah. for this so <laughs> take your time we're gonna do like five more minutes of uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can hands down say from all the, no offense, to the rest, it was amazing talks, but into Anjad Sharaf, how you've changed, how you've brought change through art, it's Anjad extremely muassir. So, Anjad, shukran ilkon ktir. Uh, so Ali Ilkon, who, you know, as you can tell, yani, uh, most of us here are scholars and practitioners, Anna, myself, and Anna Bidros. But it's really important to see how storytelling, how theater, how art can be such a catalyst for change. So Ali Ilkon, and when, when the world tells you, look, we go into medicine, we go into doctor, we publish papers, we don't know what How can we, what should we do to say that art, art makes a change? Art, is, art is, touches the heart and the soul and is a driver for change. How can we, as students, help you help, help bring science and art together, I guess, is the question. So, yeah. Mm. Oh, question. Amazing question. You answer. Hey. No, it's uh, the, what comes to your mind? Why, why listening? It's been an hour we're talking. I kid you had ideas. What <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Uh, this silo and no science being on its own, or policies on its own, or just لماذا نقعد نحكي نسردة بعد العشاء أو لازم يكون ببليزر وعم بعطي كونفرنس لحدا يسمعني that's not true you can be impactful without having the quote unquote traditional credentials بالعكس you can know so much more wisdom بس إنه how can how just هلا أنت مثل منك you're so interesting I can watch you for an hour لا then I, can, then I can watch you, you sign are off you. <laughs> That's uh, what I mean. You are interesting. Yeah. You are uh, a, you? a scientist, blah, 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 academic. <laughs> but you are so interesting that I would be interested in knowing more what you do. 
because, because yeah. you are interesting. Because and you're, you're passionate. Uh, you're passionate and you're allowing this passion to, to, to be there. And we're all passionate. Sorry, I'm My belief, so imagine, Anna, by the shar on Albik, imagine, Anna, I go into a prison where everything is dead. Everything should be dead. But nothing is dead because we are human beings who have this passion you have. Even a criminal has this passion, this innocence. I want to do something because I don't know to do in my life. And this is what you have. And this is what you need to create with your students one day if you intend to stay in the academic. هيدا اللي بدك تذكرينا فيه دايما. Keep it alive. Huh? Keep Whatever it you do, it's cooking, theater, uh, uh, just do it with passion. If you, if you can also create a formula to kill all the politicians, it would be great. <laughs> uh, so help us. <laughs> very, very cool. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi. I first want to thank you for speaking so openly and without filters. Um, I know that the three of you are actively trying to rock the boat and instigate change. And I wanted to ask if you've ever faced censorship or retaliation in that front. And I wanna, I'm curious about whether the safeguards for freedom of expression are still there in Lebanon. And, and me personally, I grew up between Syria and Lebanon, and I actively saw the contrast. In Syria, in every, in every building they say there is a Natur who is a spy. And if you speak on the phone, you hear the khash khash that someone's listening in on the line. <laughs> Versus in Campaign. Lebanon, it was, so I came later in life to Lebanon, it was so freeing to be able to speak so openly and express myself. And I, I wanted to see what are your um, experiences in Lebanon and perhaps outside of Lebanon with freedom of speech and retaliation. I think, I think the way that we talk about any agenda that we have, we never really thought about a specific ceiling. Uh, like you said, Lebanon is, has a bit more freedom than other places. I mean, compared to the States, it's nothing. Uh, unfortunately, every single politician or political party has some sort of militia backing it. So you're always, we don't really walk on eggshells. I think that fear was completely destroyed after the, uh, after, sorry, the October 17 revolution and made even more prominent after August 4th, I think when us three, uh, and I'm sure a few other people, saw the damages that were, had been brought upon by these politicians and these militias that keep governing us, there's not really anything to, to fear anymore once you see this level of atrocity. And so it's not about whether or not we're afraid, it's that we don't have anything more to lose because what's happening is completely wrong and we have to do something about it. You know. yeah. <laughs> but serious. Ma, uh, from my you know, experience in prison, anyway, I was working on the government territory. Uh, prison is their territory, it's not mine. So yes, there was censorship for my text. But, no, I, I, I always knew what would not be censored, so I would put it. Yeah, and I know what are the red uh, flags So no, really big censorship started never. But I, in a way, I, I don't want to deceive you, but Lebanon, I'm not sure it's still the same one you kept in your uh, brain. It's not like we are uh, mafia spies, but now it's more categorical of uh, what's yes and what's no and why you'd go to prison for uh, our investigation. We are turning into, uh, they are so scared of a new uh, revolution or a search. So, ah, they're Absolutely. They, they're I, cracking down a bit more on, on people. But again, I'm, you know, when, when I'm going to keep going back on August 4th because for me this is the fuel of everything and I think uh, media as well. You know, when you see people under the rubble, when you see media uh, doing this entire food distribution operation for the people that lost their homes and you know, an entire city that's completely destroyed, you're like, خلاص, what are you going to do? Yeah, خلاص. Okay, so it's not out of fear, it's more out of, there's nothing more to lose. Basically. Uh, a bit serious, to get a bit... Uh... Two more. Table two more, we're good. Go, Saeed. <laughs> yeah. Go do I'm your... Uh, go home. <laughs> <laughs> we stay. <laughs> nah, and we came from the Middle East to here. Uh, 24 hours trip. Uh, two more? <laughs> Why, Saeed? <laughs> no, I'm staying. Go, Saeed. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 
and are you in a hurry, Yani? Are you in a hurry? You are in a hurry. Ah, dear. Ah, I'm Mr. Rida. I'm Mr. Rida. I'm the I'm Mr. Rida big time. One, <laughs> ten more. Two. I'm sure ten more. <laughs> in the Arab world, we're like this, like this. One, two, and then meet and greet outside. Three minutes okay. left. Yes. Ah. Woo. Yalla, 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 yalla. One. Oh. Wait, who's going? You won't wait for a mic. Okay. Uh, no. Khalas, <coughs> <laughs> we repeat what I okay, Uli. Her question is a little bit personal. <laughs> <laughs> the mic is coming. Khalas, I'm saying it. Okay, so I have a very close friend. He's a French-Afghan journalist. She has a friend. He's a Ayala. journalist. Hey, hey, okay, hey, okay. Um, and he's, uh, he's been in prison by the Taliban the last two months. I'm wondering, uh, and I'm trying to leverage the media, and I feel like I can't be here without bringing it up. Uh, his name is Mohtaza Bahboudi. I'm wondering, when it comes to um, helping fellow journalists, helping fellow advocates have been imprisoned who are advocating for, you know, just change, political change and human rights, what can we do to help them? Because we're help they're there to help us and we're helping each other. So how can we help in that kind of situation? That his situation, it's not just, you know, uh, a singular one. Obviously, we have many friends and uh, I mean we're all friends right but uh, how, how can we help in that situation? I, th I think out of experience media. yeah I mean out of experience go ahead we want. No, media. Media? I, I don't know I, I, in, in our experience we have a lot of friends of ours who go to jail every now and then and you know get get hit and, and beaten and stuff and the only thing the only salvation or the only means of helping is to actually be there to support them in you know big quantities I don't know if this is going to be the case. This is you have to put, different put pressure. Big. You have to put pressure, but you know, in our part of the region, it's very hard. You have people, even if you have a um, very huge uh, thing on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, sometimes it, it doesn't work, but you have to keep going and to put pressure and talk about it. They tend to forget us after two weeks, you know, in our region. Amnesty. Amnesty International, yeah. And for example, what I've done each time I had a friend, luck take, we would... Amnesty, we. Lobby with the Amnesty, they would do some work depending or, who's the director at that time. And or Reporters Sans Frontières. It helped. I mean, yeah. Uh, journalists without borders. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then final question, and then we're going to take a group photo this way. Yeah, it's up. I'll take my time. Hello, uh, thank you so much uh, for you know all the great words and um, wisdom. Um, so you know, growing up here and you know being Lebanese, I feel as if so much of the time we're sort of just screaming to like the world to be like, this is what is happening. And a lot of the times we do that through our art, but unfortunately, in my experience, people really only care about us when we are expressing our pain rather than the joy and the beauty and like the culture, the love, every piece in between all the war, the destruction, the blasts. And it's so hard to find this balance between being seen and only being seen for as victims of colonialism, of brutal, brutality, of wisdom, of um, destruction. So it's like, how do we continue to show the beauty of our culture and all we represent and the total experience of who we are, not just these little pieces that, yes, have collectively traumatized us and have hurt us, but also continue to show, like, birth even more beautiful resistance and peace. It's, it's just hard to, like... To find to amplify the good because it feels like everything's focused on the negative, and then after two weeks, no one's focusing on us at all, even after the negative, so to speak. Can I answer? Um, we totally agree, but don't you feel that there is a little change happening when you see all the rappers coming from Egypt, coming from Palestine, coming from Iraq, and the whole region, and people are talking about them? abroad. 
in other countries. When you see that uh, Zena is going everywhere Mayas. with her movies, when you see Mayas in uh, uh, America Got Woo! Talent, yeah, when you see um, people watching Serde, even if they're not Arabs, not Lebanese, not Arabs, and trying to understand and in a positive way what uh, we're doing, our movies, our series on Netflix, on Shahed, everywhere, there is a little change, and it's up to us to show another image of us, not only, you know, they're Arabs. May I, uh, yeah. add? Uh, so I was sitting, me and Medea, at the opening with the beautiful uh, band, Oud, Will Flute, Will. Uh, that was a moment of pure Arab joy. 100%. Yeah, exactly. Yesterday. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hatta nahna, we have missed it. Uh, no, we have missed seeing this, you know, because also in Lebanon, it's uh, we are victims, we are Gaza, al alam depressed, yeah. you know. But this was a beautiful moment of joy. If you can create this in your own circle, start it in, in your little circle, then in the wider circle, please go ahead. Yani. Uh, this is what I've been trying to do all my life. This is what they are effect. trying. This is what you need to try to do, and, uh, you know. Voilà. Thank you. Amazing. How many minutes? Zero minutes? We're done. Zero. If we could have one more round of applause for our three incredible panelists. And then, stand up and take the photo.